we put each of our perfect players up on uh, social media to let the viewers decide who had created the best all-round player. We had thousands of votes coming on this. Um, would you like to hear who they went for? Yes, come on. Go who on. Drum roll. Can you start in third place? I'm not even going to tell you. <laughs> uh, but before I, I give you the results, a quick reminder of who we each picked. So I went um, with um, left foot of Diego Maradona, the right foot of Trent Alexander-Arnold, the speed of Adama Traore, the passing of Glenn Hoddle, the dribbling of Lionel Messi, the skill of Zico, the physicality of Paul McGrath, the defending of Franco Baresi, and the football IQ of Johan Cruyff. To Alan's team, the left foot of Roberto Carlos, the right foot of, guess who, Alan Shearer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the speed of Thierry Henry, passing of Trent Alexander-Arnold, the dribbling of Ronaldo, the skill of Zinedine Zidane, the physicality of Graham Souness, defending of John Terry, and the football IQ of Paul Scholes. Ooh, good, that Alan. Micah. The left foot of Lionel Messi, the right foot of David Beckham, the speed of Thierry Henry, passing of Kevin De Bruyne, the dribbling of Ronaldinho, the skill of JJ Acocha, physicality of John Carew, the defending of Paolo Maldini, and the football IQ of Diego Maradona. Oh! So, just to prove once and for all um, that our listeners, our viewers, don't know what the hell they're talking about, <laughs> I'll, g- <laughs> I'll tell you who has come out on top. We ran a poll on both Twitter and Instagram. Interestingly, the results from each platform are a little bit different. On Instagram, there was a clear winner. Gary got... 18% of the vote. <laughs> Alan got 26%. Oh. And Micah, 56% more than half big of the audience meeks. side with Big Meeks. You know why, Alan? Because he's basically gone for a team of his, his era. Duh! Nobody knows some of the players that I mean, Zico and Cruyff. I mean, come on. <laughs> anyway, on Twitter, it was a lot closer. Um, I was still last. <laughs> 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 With 23% of the vote, Micah 35%, and Alan got 42%. Yes! <laughs> I think Alan was uh, stirring up the Geordies to come out and support Big Al. That's, um, he definitely uh, was. That's yeah. pathetic. Big Mix, let me ask you a question. How many times did you vote for yourself on Instagram? Uh, a couple. You did as well, didn't you? <laughs> Um, thanks to everyone responding for that particularly the 18% that that went for my team the rest (laughs) of you can well do one anyway (laughs) on to the questions Liam McVeigh would you rather win the Ballon d'Or or a World Cup golden boot I'm perfectly happy with my World oh, Cup goal. Oh, how did we know that was coming? <laughs> He's up. writing his own questions now, he is. No, this is <laughs> I'm not, I'm not. But it does bring us around to the conversation we had on um, on Saturday, Alan, because we had the Ballon d'Or in the office, didn't we, we all, did. all day? And then in the studio for the opening um, yeah. for Saturday night's show. And we were talking about our own, you know, <laughs> close <laughs> close calls, shall we say. Uh, yeah. in terms of winning um, the Ballon d'Or. Of course, Alan, you were third in 96. Yeah. And I was second um, <laughs> in 86. Now, on the opening of the show last night, I kind of reminded viewers that you finished third. and But and yeah. at least with the FA Cup, you finished second. <laughs> um, <laughs> But you responded to me, which I imagine probably went over most people's heads by saying, yeah. I've got one word to say to you, Belenoff. Um, because as as Alan knows, we were having the conversation and I, I still to this day feel completely robbed of the Ballon d'Or. Of let it go, guys, let it I go. I have let it go. But when I saw the Ballon d'Or in the building, it came back. It came back. So, <laughs> Who won it in your era, Gaz? A chap called Igor Belenoff. And he scored one great goal in the World Cup. I think he got four in the World Cup. Um, and <laughs> the Eastern Bloc kind of got together because they'd never had a winner, I think, and just 
decided it was him. But I'm I'm very pleased for Igor. I had it. Uh, you know when you were, when you were um, getting ready to say that. I had it in my mind, Belenov, 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 and yeah. honestly, I was petrified. I was gonna, I was gonna say Belend or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> actually, that should be quite funny. Oh God! Uh, I was just, I was, and it kept saying Belenov, Belenov, Belenov. Get it in my head. Don't, don't get it. Don't get this wrong. This is, this is not the rest of football. It's match of the day. It's a yeah. BBC. You get sacked. <laughs> yeah, indeed. I, I have to remind you as well that the Ballon d'Or was slightly different in, in our time. It was basically European Football of the Year because, um, well, it was European Football of the Year, but it was called the Ballon d'Or um, because they the world, they had a different thing. And obviously Diego Maradona uh, w- would have won it and did win World Player. I came second in that as well. <laughs> yeah, I did. I actually finished second in that one. Did so, you? Yeah. Anyway, yeah. yeah. Where's your golden boot, Gaz? Can't you get it for the viewers? I've already got it out. One seven. I? That was I on the uh, top ten, wasn't it? Top ten. Yes. Ten, that, oh, you've got Harry going down. Different oh. audience. Come on. Yeah. All right. We'll go and get it. Carry on. <laughs> we'll carry on. Um, we've lost our producer for a minute, but that's fine. As Gary's got a golden boot, I would much prefer to win the Ballon d'Or. I mean, it's much more prestigious, isn't it? <laughs> I think it is now. I think it is now. But at the time. <laughs> Um, well, you've got a golden boot. I know it's a slightly inferior competition, Alan, but <laughs> Well, I, I got second in England Player of the Year. Under 12. How's that for a accolade? Under 12s. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 something. Oh, here oh, we go. We'll hold it up. We'll hold it up. Oh, oh look, look at that, that bad boy. It's heavy, it's heavy. Ooh. By the way, it's got to be on your mind soon. You've got to be thinking of selling that. Then guys need to cash in before you keel over. <laughs> That's a good point. And that was another thing we were waffling on about on Saturday night, wasn't it? You've, said, you've now decided I'm actually on the 18th tier of my lifetime. And it's a par three. <laughs> Have you taken a shot yet or not? I hope it's like the 17th at Sawgrass and I can knock it in the water about eight times, at least delay the process a little bit. Uh, right, Jamie R. What is your take on the potential for Newcastle to move to a new stadium? As it's been reported recently, it's being considered. That was yet another subject we talked about on Saturday, mm. Alan. I hope if it does happen, I really hope it's next door and they keep it in the city centre. Um, there's there is talk about it moving to behind the Leeds' end, um, which yeah, I'd I'd be uh, I'd be okay with that in an ideal world. If you're giving me a choice, I would stay at St James's Park and try and extend. But if that can't be done, I understand why. Um, but it needs to stay in the city centre. Yeah. Can you sort out the slant on the pitch if you get a new stadium? No, that that works. That works in Newcastle's favour. Would you keep that really? <laughs> <laughs> shouldn't shouldn't even be allowed. I know exactly. You didn't even know about it until I told you. So what are you on about? <laughs> I was still running uphill. That's why I <laughs> to have a word with you, um, Vlad. What was the best pre-match team talk you were ever given during your career, and as part of which team? Ooh, mm. very good. Let me think of that one. I would have to Micah's say... was just before the QPR game, wasn't it? When you, you won the league with the Aguero moment where Mancini read out the team and you weren't in it. I fell off the chair! I just only broke my neck. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> oh, I can't. I can't top that, guys. I can't top it. Uh, there was the one with um, you'll know as well as I do, Alan, that, that Bobby Robson's team talks could go on a bit. Yeah. Um, and I think I've told the story yonks ago on maybe the match of the day top ten that we we did together, do together. So I was thinking, you know, it was after that we played the first two games and we'd only got one point. We were bang up against it and. We had a team meeting um, at the hotel before we left for the ground. And the clipboard was out as always with Bobby. And I thought this is going to be a, oh, it's going to be a long, long, long one. <laughs> and he basically just stood up and he went, lads, 
he says, I trust you to get out there and get the result we need. You can look at all the permutations you want, every single one of them, he says, but we know all that matters today is that we go out there, we win this game, we go through. You're more than capable. I've got every faith in you. And then he went, so come on. And we every it was like goosebumps. And we all got we all got up. Yeah, come on, come on. And then he went, but in case anyone wants to know all the permutations, here they are. <laughs> and then he turned the page over on his clipboard and spent 45 minutes going through every possibility. <laughs> oh, Classic that's Bobby. Brilliant Bobby, uh, brilliant. Yeah, that was so so what true. A man. Yeah. Uh Nazrul. How do you think the Euros compares to the Copper America in terms of intensity and talent level? Does Copper America get enough credit, particularly in Europe? Probably doesn't get reported as much, does it? Because of of when it's going on, and and there's other things going on as well. Whilst that's uh, whilst that's happening, so we don't underestimate it, and certainly. The players that go to play in it, you, you can tell how much they're desperate to go and play in that tournament and, and go and win it. So I think I think we're aware of how much it means, aren't we? Have you watched a Copa America game? Um, it is ferocious. Mm. It's it's like going 100 miles an hour all the time. Like they don't give Messi no 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 time, no space, and obviously he's he's won it, but it's. it's it's Gosh. madness. It's like watching mm. a game on fast forward. I think it's really good watch. Um, I don't think at times the tactics are as good as, say, a Euros. Um, but yeah, I, I think the standard is very good. It's just very quick and sometimes the tackles are very rash. Mm. Well, you've, you've got the world champions at the moment, haven't you, in Argentina. What I would say, and I think, I think this probably answers the question, is that I imagine in South America... It's it's hugely hugely watched, uh, much more than they would watch the Euros. And likewise, mm. in Europe, yeah. we would be more interested in watching the Euros and Copa America because it's it's only natural because your exactly. country will be competing. So, yeah. and 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 we can say Africa Cup of Nations as well. So you know yeah. that each in their own continent will be the the most appreciated and the most watched tournament. Correct. I would imagine. Uh, Craig, who in the 1998 England squad came up with the idea of trying to get as many song titles into interviews as possible? Who was the best at doing it? Are there any uh, instances of players trying to do a similar thing? Well, I think it was you, wasn't it? It was, yeah. Yeah, it was. Uh, it, I mean, it worked really well. You know, we had such a laugh doing it and it went on for such a long time before anyone clicked on to what was happening. Um I'm sure Gareth even got one in. I remember watching Gareth because yeah. the room was next to the TV room, was next to our TV room, if you like, where we got interviewed. You could hear all the inter- <laughs> And as soon as you mentioned the song, you could hear the roar next door. And I'm sure Gareth, someone set Gareth the task of trying to get dancing on the ceiling. It, it, and I'm sure yeah, he I came actually, out with it. He did, he did, I remember it. We're yeah. not exactly dancing on the ceiling after the result or something like that. He could hear the roar next door go up with the players go, Ray! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it worked really well. Yeah. Did Do you remember, Al, when we was doing Match of the Day, uh, Bradley Walsh texted you? That's right, yeah, yeah. And he was giving you wor- <laughs> giving us words to say on, on Match of the Day during the analysis. A, I think it was a Brentford game. It was something to say, right, you've got to get the bees in and say they've managed to get... So they feel as if they've stung someone. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> it was yeah. amazing. We've got to yeah. do one. Say it's boring match of the day. Oh. Micah, is there any such thing as a boring match of the day? Yeah, just last Saturday. <laughs> because you weren't on it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, okay. But this question kind of follows on from that. Um, from Adam Vaughan. After seeing Gary sing with Gary Barlow for the 2014 World Cup, uh, what is the most embarrassing thing you've ever done being asked to do for TV? I think that when I did the thing with Gary Bond, I think that might have been comic relief. I might have been. It, pretty it was wooden, certainly a charity you? thing. It certainly was. I don't think it was anything to do with the 2014 World Cup. At least I don't think it was. Or maybe it was because my memory. But I do remember being with Gary and he had his... Um, 
he had his kind of, I don't know what you would describe him as, but he was almost like a musical coach, a singing coach, as well as probably his producer or something. And he was trying, and, and Gary said to me, he went, don't worry, he can make anyone sound good. Uh, sadly, he couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Did I tell you about the time I went and met Lionel Richie? At New- he came to Newcastle to the arena to sing. Have I told you this story? I don't think so. I don't remember this. We went backstage afterwards to uh, to meet him and someone had tipped him off and he'd asked for a signed shirt. So I was sort of giving him a signed shirt and, and, he, and he said to me, apparently... You do a decent, uh, you do a decent karaoke song of all night long. I need you to sing it to me, and I was like, "No way!" Honestly, I said, "Really?" He goes, "Really?" And I'd had a few drinks, and I found myself singing again all night long in front of Lionel oh Richie. Oh my god! And wow. I woke up in the morning and I thought, "You absolute dickhead! What have you just done?" <laughs> <laughs> Not no video it. footage so or anything. Oh, is there any? Yeah, there right. Any, uh, I, I, I was drunk, but I wasn't that drunk. It wasn't yet in that get out. <laughs> he's a great, he's a great guy, Lionel. I did, um, I did two Walkers ads um, with him way back, and one of them I had to push him through the shop window through a glass thing. And, and um, um, let's say we had to hang around for him for quite a while, both days. Um, he doesn't. I don't think he likes getting up much before two in the afternoon. Um, <laughs> Or at least he would arrive late. Um, but he was he was he was lovely actually, and um, yeah. spent a couple of good days with him. And then I went to LA a few years later, and I was in the Soho house there, you know, in, in Los Angeles, and um, was on that top floor. And I was with George, my my eldest actually. And we were having a bite to eat, and Lionel Richie was in there by the window at the end. And George said, oh, you've got to go and say hello. You did a commercial. I went, oh, no, he's with, he's with people. I'm not doing that. I'm too embarrassed. He went, go on, go on. You've got to say hello. I said, oh, what? yeah, but what if he... What? So anyway, and I was just terrified of him going, who are you? <laughs> but as it happens, he was absolutely lovely. Yeah, lovely. Um, Great guy. Really lovely. great guy. Very nice. Uh, Kiki, or Kiki, uh, asks... How did you find the transition to life after playing? And what advice would you give to current players about preparing for life after their playing career? There are paths like pundits or managing clubs, but what about the rest of the players? I think there's far more opportunities now for players. I mean, it's when you and when I finished, guys, I mean, there was a... There weren't, certainly there weren't as many TV channels and football wasn't as shown as much as it is now. Yeah. Um, whether it's... TV, radio, podcasts, what, what there's, 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 a, there's certainly a lot. But what I would say is, is do make sure you plan because it's bloody tough when you retire. You have to plan to do something because it's hard when you retire. Good advice, Alan. I would say um, don't be afraid to push the boundaries and go outside your comfort zone because if you ask me, would I be a pundit? seven or eight years ago, I would have laughed at you. I, w- yeah. I just think, I-, I like the banter. I like the, the dressing room feeling of it. It, it sort mm-hmm. of got that um, that feel when we go to work at times, but I just didn't think I would enjoy punditry and now I absolutely love it. So, so I would people just you say, work with. T- take risks, you know? Eh? It's the people you work with. <laughs> well... I do work for a few channels, don't I? So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, it's it's tough, actually. I mean, yeah. on a serious note, I mean, a lot of players do struggle with with life um, after football um, because not you know not all of them uh, have been as lucky as perhaps we have and stumbled into something else yeah. um, to do. But you're right in terms of planning, but even that can go wrong, of course. Um, I think a lot of players have a difficult time when they finish. Um, Obviously, the fame suddenly subsides, the the buzz of the Saturday afternoon, the Wednesday evening, um, the crowd. um, Suddenly, they're not earning any more. Even when you've been accustomed to earning a lot of money, that can be different. There's a lot of life left after football, if you're lucky, for most of us. So... It is tough, um, and I think a lot of players have difficulties. I think the divorce rates of footballers between the ages of 35 and 40 is something like 70-odd percent. Um, wow. Because, you know, 
life changes quite dramatically and not always for the better. In fact, it's hard for it to change for the better after football unless you're really lucky. Um, so I'm certainly thankful for... Yeah. Um, we've been fortunate enough to, to, to find something else to do around the sport that, that we love, but that's not the case for everyone. What was the reasons that you came into broadcasting? Though? Was it just a love of football? Well, for me, it was... Um, I always enjoyed journalism. I used to write match reports when I was a kid, when I used to go to the Leicester games. Um, even during my career, I always looked at the media side of it and thought it was something really interesting. So it was that really. And having an agent that, you know, was always, always kind of insistent on thinking about the future, what you're going to do post football, what you're going to do for the next five years, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. I was always really hopeful that I would go, I would stay in football and, and or maybe have a couple of years out of it and go back into it. I was doing my coaching badges. So I always thought I was going to do that, but sort of went to the meet. I, I started the doing co-coms with the England games for Sky in the last sort of 18 months of my playing career and in the hope that that would sort of keep me involved for two or three years and then I'd go back into football. So um, that's how I got into it, Mike, are you? Wow. I didn't know you did co-coms straight off the bat. Yeah, nice. I did it with, uh, with Martin Tyler uh, for the England games, yeah. I did one or two of those as well for ITV as well. Did you? Way back, way back, yeah. Uh, Colin Gunn. Will Arsenal's injuries and suspensions benefit them in the long run? It's good to see Arteta being forced to use his squad this season. Could it be a benefit for them come the end of the season? Well, that's a positive way of looking at um, having a few serious injuries. It's hard, really, because when Partey was playing right back the other day, you got Timber playing left back, Ben White shifted across the centre back, which is his position anyway. But when you break up that relationship with Saliba and Gabriel, it's always going to be tough. I thought they did well against Liverpool at times, but they did miss Gabriel when he came off the pitch and, and certainly Saliba. It's good that we're getting to see new players, but ultimately when Arsenal were pushing for the league last year, they, they pretty much had a full squad. So I think if they want to win it this year, They've got to get everyone back fit. You can have a period of four to six weeks where you can sort of paper over the cracks a little bit. But if they want to, to win the league, they've got to get everyone fit as soon as possible. Yeah, agreed. I mean, it's, you need all your big hitters. I mean, if, if if City, even Liverpool, had three or four of the big hitters, out, i.e., I don't know, Haaland or... De, well, De they have got a couple, or, out, haven't they? Yeah, They've I get that. Yeah, but, and the and the quality that they bring in. But if you've got three or four of your mainstays like Saliba, Odegaard, and they didn't have Saka last weekend, then um, yeah, that that's that's going to be tough for for any team to cope with. But I thought Arsenal did all right. I thought they were they were the as we said they were the best team against Liverpool certainly in the first half, um, not the second half. But yeah, I thought they did all right. Okay, let's go on to Haraldor Ingi. Great name. Which team has surprised you most so far in the Champions League this season? Ooh, very good question. Well, Villa have been amazing, haven't they? Yes, good shout, Alan. I was going to say Villa, three wins from three, you'd, you'd have to say um, them. Yeah. Well, the three English teams at the top, aren't they, with Manchester City and Liverpool as well. Yeah. So, um, I'd say Brest... Um, that wasn't meant. Uh, don't smirk, Mike. Mate, it's mate. Just Brest, the team in France. Um, I think it's Northwest France. I think Brest, um, who are going really well. Um, two wins and a draw, uh, which is, I think, pretty impressive. Celtic, in a weird way, considering they actually got battered in one game seven. They, you know, got four points from the other two games, which. You know, gives them a chance of being in that probably realistically in the middle block. Was this a question surprise you the most, like doing well or doing bad? Well, either I suppose whatever you want Both. to read into it. You know, Atletico Madrid have been I know under par. Really? They lost that four nil, didn't they, to, to Benfica, which was just a, a, a crazy game. I, I just couldn't believe what I was was watching normally Atletico are really good defensively, but 
that 4 0 loss against Benfica, only three points in in the league format. Yeah, they've surprised me. I think Simeone is doing what he occasionally does and he goes, right, we're going to play a more attacking style of football and it doesn't work and then he reverts to plan A. A, Exactly Mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I think that usually happens. Villa, I would say, definitely. Yeah, you've got Villa. Villa Villa have been amazing, the three out of three. On the other other side, Bayern Munich probably. Bayern, yeah. yeah, One win, struggled, uh, beaten by, obviously, Aston Villa and then smashed by Barcelona, so... They're struggling. Yep. Right, Michael Hughes. I've always wondered how referees communicate with players in international or Champions League games. Do they have multiple languages in their locker and use the applicable one depending on the player they're talking to? Now, I did a bit of research on this because I didn't know the answer. I kind of presumed it might be, um, I probably English would be the most obvious um, language spoken, but... Uh, This is the um, blurb. Uh, Referees at the international level communicate with players using a variety of methods, including body language. Um, Referees use gestures, their whistle and other signals to convey information. Uh, Cards, red and yellow cards, were invented to help referees communicate when language barriers exist. Speaking... Referees will speak clearly and loudly enough for players to hear and they should be prepared to explain their decisions. English. English is the default language for soccer referees in FIFA and UEFA and is commonly used in most interactions between players and referees. As regards other languages, FIFA officials are required to speak English in addition to their native language and are encouraged to learn one of FIFA's other official languages. Uh, International teams will often analyse the referee who will be officiating their game, paying attention to how they communicate and use cards. This helps ensure that everyone is on the same page and that the playing field is level. Um, That's nearly as um, complex as the handball (laughs) law. Uh, But that, that kind of makes sense, I think. Overall. So English then? Yeah, I mean, I could have kind of cut that down a little bit, <laughs> couldn't I? But, but thanks. It's a good question. It's a, it's a yeah. valid question. Uh, Simon Ford, what was the most physical of battles you faced against an opponent and who came out on top? Cool, you, you, you've got a few of those, Alan. Well, Tony Adams, I remember walking off Highbury once, I had uh, seven stitches in the t- my lip here, right up the middle, and broken nose. Explains the looks. That was a decent battle, yeah, so... yeah. I always knew what you were going to get. (laughs) (laughs) My nose is pretty straight now, (laughs) isn't it? Three times I had it broken. Who's yours, Gaz? He didn't like physical battles. He stayed away from them. Mine would have probably been um, a a defender for France called Basil Bolly. Basil Bolly, yes. Wasn't he the guy that head-butted Stuart Pearce as well? Yes. I remember playing in the Euros, Al. You made 92. Um, mm-hmm. And he was marking me from corners, but he wasn't m- just marking me. He was giving me like a bear hug, not in a romantic way, in the way that I couldn't breathe. <laughs> and he was screaming, he was just arms around me. And this is obviously before VAR. And he just held me and held me and held me. I was like, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> so he did this about two or three corners, whatever we had. And I just, it was just, I said to the ref, I mean, come on. I don't think, I mean, I don't think the ref had had done that thing where you had to speak English because I was going, what are you? And anyway, so he's hugging, he's squeezing me, squeezing me. And and eventually I thought, I sod this. And I stamped on his toe. Mm, Gary Lineker, you naughty boy. Well, you did that a little bit, didn't you? But you know, you could get away with something like that. But it was only so I could breathe, Alan. So I think it was self-defense in some ways. And then in, in the Euros final, Um, after the game, we were walking out into the car park and who comes up to me to say hello? He went, ah, Gary, we had some great battles when we played. And and I thought, I know that. And I thought, my God, it's Basil Bolly. Basil (laughs) Bolly. I said, do you want to give me a hug? And he just (laughs) laughed. And I think we talked about the the incident where he he head-butted Stuart Pearce as well. He was a toughy Basil Bolly. But he was... I mean, the sweetness and light he was when you met him there. You just thought, <laughs> oh, well, fair enough. Basil Bolly, is that his full name? He's like his second name. No, that was it. Basil Bolly, yeah. <laughs> like Bolly Nazy. What? I don't know. What, <laughs> what do you mean is that his name? 
Bar- Basil Bully. It's a funny name, that. Yeah, you have any physical battles, Michael, because I don't think too many people want to take you on with those guns. No, no one took on Big Meeks. Not a chance. Have you seen these guns? Wow, look at that. I ate you strikers for lunch. (laughs) So no one. This was no one you had a real... If there was one, John Carew, I put him in the uh, the perfect player, didn't I? You did. (laughs) You got John Carew in your starting lineup of of your best ever team and you won. No, no, the strongest. The strongest. (laughs) And and John Carew was a player. Um... But yeah, I just remember trying to sh- shoulder barge him a couple of times and I bounced off him twice and he just yeah. turned around. He and must have been strong me. if you bounced off him. And yeah, he was definitely the strongest. There you go. I think this one's aimed at you, Micah. Final oh. question. From Tej, T-E-J, if that's how you say it. Given that Spurs are a stronger side without Harry Kane, <laughs> is it possible Liverpool will be a stronger side next season once Salah, in all likelihood, moves on. Nope. <laughs> nope, 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 nope. That's not, a Not a chance. Not a chance. I, Liverpool need Salah. And the reason why I say that is Salah can score even when he's not playing well. He, that is the difference. He's just, so many times he's unlocked the door just by being in the right position. A piece of skill, whether it be a set piece, um... Even his goal against Arsenal, the movement. I, I just think Salah, I, I don't think anyone can replace him right now. Are you saying Salah's a better forward than Harry Kane? No, I'm just saying oh, right. he is... What he's done over Liverpool in terms of three Champions League finals, winning the Champions League, winning the league, what he's done at Liverpool has be, been more important to his career in terms of trophies. You were about, you about to say, and then I think you changed your mind, then more important than Kane was to Tottenham. You were about I to say I was thinking, that, I, I, I'm going to sound like a right. <laughs> and then you, put the, like, bra- whoa, you whoa, put the brakes on, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I was <laughs> thinking, <laughs> the ball ball <laughs> I was thinking, no, no, <laughs> that's not the right way to go, Micah. <laughs> I could see your brain ticking there, going, da 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 recompute. Trophies, trophies, trophies. What a way to finish. Great stuff. Um, That's it for this episode. Uh, Thank you once again for sending in your questions. Uh, We'll be back on Friday with an interview with Martin Keown, who's who's written a book. And it's it's brilliant, honestly. There's some amazing stories in there. I think you'll really enjoy it. So um, that'll be out with you on Friday morning. But for now, that's it from me. Goodbye. Goodbye from me. Goodbye from me.